So, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to begin by uh, congratulating all of those involved in uh, the campaigning and passing of the Future Generations Act. And I'm delighted to be here on this momentous day. And also to begin by thanking the, the team here who have done such a great job in organising everything. What I want to do in, in my uh, 15 minutes is uh, make three points and uh, just hone in on those. The background, though, is that I think we're very familiar with the challenges of, of short-termism. Uh, many people come at this from their own particular viewpoint. So some of us work a lot on climate, and what looms large there is uh, the prospect of not taking sufficient action now to prevent dangerous climate change. But it crosses so many different policy areas, whether it's housing, uh, education, funding of education, secondary, tertiary, uh, whether it's disaster preparedness. Um, and these can be harmful, these, these failures to act now for the future, for two kinds of reasons. One is just enlightened self-interest. There's a, a fascinating analysis of uh, Hurricane Katrina, which came to the conclusion that they spent 15 times more on coping with the damage than was required to prepare in advance for the damage. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to appeal to intergenerational obligations for that. That's just about enlightened self-interest here and now. But there are very important obligations we have to those who come after us to leave the world in at least a good a condition. And um, it seems on the face of it that we're not doing very well at, at honouring those. For me, and I work in a politics department, the politics really matters. So my uh, can I just, um, three points are really uh, looking at political institutions, in particular legislatures, and thinking, uh, now how can we best think about institutions to cope better with the challenges that the future will uh, raise for us? Now, the first I'm going to talk about is the drivers of short-termism. If you're confronted with inflation or unemployment, an economist will tell you, well, we've got to look at what's causing the problem and have a policy designed to deal with the cause. If you've got flooding, then you'll do the same thing. You'll look at what's causing the flooding and you'll respond to that. Um, if you're faced with uh, increasing social problems, you'll do exactly the same thing. You want to know what's the underlying uh, causes that are bringing this about. So my first point is then, um, we need to think about why there might be a problem of short-termism in the first place. You know, what creates the problem? Because only then can we think effectively about how to respond to it. I'm not going to go through all of these, and actually it's incomplete. <laughs> but uh, I think there's, there's two types of uh, factor that are creating a problem for us. Underlying this is the fact that we can affect the long term. If we, if we didn't affect the long term, then we'd have much of a, less of a problem. But we do. And we're faced with things like uh, what Michael Vance calls creeping problems. These are the ones where there's an incremental change each year, just a tiny bit, but you don't notice it because it's tiny uh, until really there's a catastrophe on your hands. And I think human cognition is just not very good at dealing with, uh, with creeping problems. Uh, the others are maybe slightly more familiar, just uh, however much we may care about other human beings, it's quite hard to motivate people to care about someone in 200 years' time, so self-interest. There are the psychological things that we're just um, very good at ignoring what's not visible, what's not in front of us. If it's not on my agenda, you know, why will I do it? Uh, we're very bad at responding to data that comes in general statistical formats. We respond much better to uh, vivid uh, impressions, so if I see someone having a car accident, that will make a much bigger impression on my views on road safety than some dry statistical data. Uh, we all, uh, or maybe not some of you, suffer from procrastination, postponing difficult, awkward decisions. So these are just features of human nature which are, are going to create a problem because uh, we're going to uh, not take action now that we should do, either in our own interest or for future generations. So I think any policies need to think about, well, are there ways of coping with these? And then there's the ones that, towards the bottom end, there's the institutional structures we live in, uh, like um, the spending settlements that are used in ministries, or the audit timeframes that are used, whether they're quarterly returns or annual returns, or five-yearly ones. Those will make an enormous difference on how people respond. And there's, of course, things like the electoral cycle and the 24 news hour cycle. 
two other things, well, so one other thing I would add to this is there's a problem of uh, what political scientists call path dependence, which is once you start going down uh, a route, you get locked into it. And so failure to do it at one point may end, commit you, for example, to an energy system that five or ten years down the line you really wish you hadn't got into, but you're locked into it. So path dependence makes all of these kind of uh, tougher problems than they might otherwise be. So I know this is quite abstract and it's quite different from the way uh, we've been talking about it so far, but I would turn to the question of if you have inflation or unemployment or flooding or poverty or alcoholism, isn't your first thought, well, what's causing this? So we need to think what's causing uh, short-termism. And then, what can we do about it? So point two, and this overlaps with what uh, Tara was saying, uh, here, are, here are four criteria for thinking about the policies. Does it work? Now, does it work shouldn't mean, does it eradicate the problem? Uh, if you're dealing with future generations, that is, people who are not yet born, I think they're inherently going to be less able to, uh, well, they're less able to protect their own interests, but they're going to be inherently vulnerable in a way that those who are here and now can often stick up and, and express their voice. So effectiveness doesn't mean does it eliminate the problem, but does it make a positive contribution? Uh, or is it negligible, or even does it make it worse? Moral legitimacy. Uh, again, just to refer to something Tara said, I mean, that's about partly substantive criteria. Like, um, you know, are we striking the right balance between the interests of the current generation and those in the future? It's not all just about protecting future generations. Uh, some current generations will say that we're facing you know, austerity, we're facing poverty. Um, yeah, what about us? And I think we need substantive criteria then. But the other point is we need sort of democratic legitimacy. And uh, Andrea mentioned various kinds of powers. I've tried to have a list in blue here of different powers. And the reason I've done this is I think that some proposals uh, are talking about quite <coughs> um, potentially draconian forms of powers. The more extensive the power, the more there is an issue of legitimation. Um, the less extensive the power, uh, the, the, more, the, the less there is a worry about democratic authorization, I think. So I'm not going to uh, read all of those out, but it was just to bring out the variety of different powers that might be available. And to make the point that, um, that democracy is an issue, if you give a veto right, for example, to any institution, then that's going to raise a lot tougher questions than ones where you're producing a report or you're doing auditing. OK, two other criteria. We need to be able to get to there from here. And that might mean that people in different countries with different traditions uh, will come up with different proposals because some are more used to parliamentary commissioners or ombudsmen, and others are more used to select committees. The fourth one, I think, hasn't been mentioned, but it's striking that, that some initiatives for protecting long-term interests um, have been cut. So I mentioned Israel and the UK Sustainable Development Commission. I was struck by what Julie Gelfin said about the, the Canadian one, which was it's actually quite hard to get rid of uh, the role. That seems to me that the relevant consideration, you don't want something when it comes up with an inconvenient um, position to be able to just get rid of it. So I think, do I have about five minutes? Or? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm just now going to do the third thing, which is throw out four uh, thoughts. And um, I'm part of a team at Yako Kuzman and Dominic Rosa uh, work together <coughs> with me, and this is very much a, a joint um, effort as to how we might think about uh, tackling some of the drivers in ways that are morally legitimate that we can get to from here. So one is, and this takes a prompt from the Finnish system, but it, it does it in a different direction. Why not have a system where the incoming government is required to give a manifesto for the future? Um, actually, Tara said one thing she wanted as a citizen was to know what the vision was uh, for the future. And I think that's, a, that's an incredibly important thing, both as uh, an account of what Britain, say, or Wales, or whichever unit one wants to choose, is going to look like in 50 years' time. What is the kind of world we want to be aiming for and bequeathing? Um, and how will it be achieved, and how will it address uh, 
you know, the, the threats that we see on the horizon and the opportunities we see on the horizon. And I guess my starting point for this is if you want to be, if you want the future to be taken seriously, you have to build it into your legislative process in some way. It can't be an afterthought that comes later on. It has to be foregrounded. So I think one way of doing this is this idea of having a manifesto for the future, where um, a government is required, let's say, to produce a statement, but also there's a, a vision of the future day built into the parliamentary timetable. A bit like a State of the Union address, where the role of the government is to say, this is what we stand up for, for the long term, and the role of the opposition, and maybe civil society organisations, maybe we can use citizen groups to feed up proposals, is to quiz them and challenge them and say, well, what are you going to do about that? How are you going to be able to achieve that? And so I'm building on an idea from Rawls, John Rawls, about public justification, that it's requiring people to think about it. And the thought here is it tackles some of the drivers. You can't ignore it if you're required to address it. You can't procrastinate if someone is saying, what's your action plan? Uh, well, you can, sorry, I rewind. It's much harder to, I could see sceptical heads going, yes, I can. It's much harder to ignore it if you have to stand up. It's much harder to procrastinate or just to give in to temptation um, if no one's ever going to quiz you about it. And it appeals to self-interest. No one wants to look uh, an idiot saying, well, actually, we haven't got a plan for the next 20, 30 years. Second thought. Again, building on something that happens in Finland, but differently. And it's something that was in the House of Commons Public Administration Select Committee. You know, why not have a select committee for the future, which, unlike the Finnish one, uh, is a select committee that scrutinises all legislation, and whose job and remit it is, is to press legislators on what are you doing for the long term? What are the long term implications of building a runway, or <coughs> these urban infrastructure plans, or some mega projects like, uh, you know, me mega projects often massively overrun in their costs by hundreds of percent. So what are you doing about those? And the thought here is it's trying to deal with the driver about um, if people are absent, like future generations, someone has to be speaking on their behalf. And I guess one thing a committee of the future can do, you know, a commissioner for the future can do as well, is act as an accountability mechanism, giving voice to the interests of the future. I think of it the other way around, which is if you wanted to ignore the future, what would you do? Oh, well, you wouldn't have a committee that's designed, whose remit is to focus on the future. You wouldn't put it on the timetable. You'd try and bury it. Uh, two more, and then I, I shall finish. So the third thought is, and many people have said this already, why not have an independent future council uh, whose remit is to uh, have long-term reports about future challenges? But also, and this I think relates to what Peter Davis was saying about future trends, um, and I like the point about doing it a year before an election to focus people's minds on it, but it could also audit <coughs> government performance. And I just wanted to throw something out which is potentially controversial to elicit a response, but it, it picks up on something that's in the uh, government's charter for budget responsibility in the OVR, where um, if you read sections 3.29 and 3.31, it says if the government is not meeting its economic um, uh, sustainability targets in economic terms, then there must be a debate in the House of Commons. So my thought, and I should say not just mine but our team, is what if there was an equivalent here for long-term planning? So if, if a government is committed to emissions reductions, what about the thought that an independent council could say, well look, Given what you're doing so far, given um, the plans that you're putting into place, uh, we don't think you're going to meet those targets. There must be a parliamentary debate where you justify and, and deliberate it. And this is where I think the notion of power comes in as very relevant, because it's a form of power. It makes people confront and think about it. They can't ignore the issue. But no one is making the legislators do anything. They don't have to pass any particular laws. So I don't think there's a worry about democratic legitimacy. So does it give us an effective way of making the future visible, but without worries about democratic illegitimacy? I think I, I should wrap up because of um, time constraints. But the fourth <coughs> one concerns uh, performance indicators. And I really wanted to say two things here. Um, firstly, drawing a bit on the Oxford-Martin report. What I think we need is a 
performance indicators that track the long term. And <coughs> as you can see, there's a whole variety of ways of doing this. But one I think is, is particularly interesting is what uh, Bob Sokolow and Stephen Davis call commitment accounting, which is if you um, build, uh, let's say, a, a new airport, under, under commitment accounting, what you have to state and work out there and then is what are the likely future projected emissions from the action then at T1. You don't just look at now at uh, what the emissions involved are, but because you're basically locking in people to some extent to a different emissions trajectory, you'd have to be able to say, yeah, we're committing ourselves to uh, this many tons of, of carbon. And you could do that also for urban design or uh, infrastructure. And the point here is about tracking the driver of uh, invisibility. It makes future impacts a lot more visible. Or rather, if you didn't do this, it's a lot easier to say, yeah, we, we agree um, that, that new kind of transport system, oh, and they can worry about the impacts in the future. And the final one was just about audit timetables. If you're auditing people over quarterlies or annuals, or even three years, and academics get audited for five years, you're going to target your self-interested activity for that. So it's like a recipe for not thinking about the long term. So it's a plea there for audit timetables that take a long term view. So um, the pitch then is, doesn't this at least address the drivers and effectiveness? Um, they seem feasible, aren't they? Can't we get from here to there? Uh, and do they raise questions of moral legitimacy? I, I don't think so. But very curious to know if you think it fails on any of these criteria. Um, thank you very much.